Hello, and welcome to this Brain Taxi virtual event. If you haven't been with us yet for an event, Brain Taxi is a nonprofit organization that champions aesthetically adventurous literature. Our work primarily revolves around a quarterly magazine of critical writing. This is our spring issue, issue 101. And if you would like to get this, we would love to mail you a copy. Check out our website after tonight's event to see if you might be interested. If you are, you might want to become a Rain Taxi member and get all of our forthcoming issues sent to your mailbox as well. Another way we advocate for literature is through events like this one. Tonight's event, like most of them, is free to attend, but if you're able to pitch in a little something, please feel free to use the donate button at the bottom of your screen. We're privileged to receive funding from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Minnesota State Arts Board, among other funders, but our most vital supporters are individuals like you. There are other ways you can participate tonight. There's the chat field, of course, so feel free to put your comments in there. Uh, we also have an ask a question box, and that's a great place if you, if you have a question for either of tonight's authors. We'd love to get to some of those at the conclusion of the event. And of course, my favorite button of all is buy the book because uh, that will send you to a page where you can uh, enter either of the books for tonight and uh, buy either or both of them from our partner bookseller tonight, Majors and Quinn here in Minneapolis. And if there are other books you'd like to get from them as well, uh, don't stop there. Any book you buy while using that book does uh, support our, our series. Uh, tonight, it's a real pleasure to have with us uh, these two authors, Catherine Nuremberger. Uh, her new book is The Witch of I, an amazing collection of lyric essays that won't surprise anyone who knows of her as a poet as well. Uh, as I do. And we're also joined by Kim Todd, uh, who's got this great new book called Sensational, one of those titles that describes not only the contents, but the nature of the book, I would say. And what I love about tonight's pairing is that uh, both of these books in very different ways get to some of the same issues. Um, so I'm excited for their conversation. I'm also glad because we're gonna be able to go moderator free tonight. Kim and Kate are friends and colleagues here at the University of Minnesota, and um, there's always a special spark when uh, when we get to eavesdrop in on a conversation between writer friends. So to delve into this look tonight at uh, women's history and how it's related, here are Kim Todd and Kate Nierenberger. Well, Eric, thank you, Eric. Yeah. So much. Um, and Kim, I'm really excited to be having this conversation with you. I just want to like, ooh, it's such a pretty, beautiful book. I'm so excited and excited to be getting to talk to you about it. Same. Um, should I start? Yeah, you start, and then then I'll go. Okay. Um, well, the the first, uh, there's so much about your book I want to ask you about, but um, I want to start. You have this character in Sensational who I find totally fascinating. And you call her girl reporter because her true identity um, remains unclear. And um, I wanted to ask you questions about researching her and writing about her. And I'm wondering if you would mind starting us off by uh, maybe reading us an excerpt that includes her so that everybody will be on the same page with us. Yes, that would be great. So the overall book is about this wave of women who did undercover and stunt reporting in the wake of Nellie Bly going into Blackwell's Insane Asylum. Um, for 10 days in 1887. And so right a year after that, you have the girl reporter um, going undercover and she goes to um, like hundreds of doctors in Chicago and asks for an abortion. And at the time an abortion was illegal. Um, and then she writes up her expose of her findings in, um, in like over the course of several weeks for the Chicago Times in 1888. Um, so the section that I'm gonna read is actually from later in the book and it talks a little bit about my efforts to find out um, who she was. We're being joined by a cat here who must have busted down the door. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Okay, so the girl reporter. 
When I first read about The Girl Reporter and her Chicago Times series, I had just quit my journalism job. When I was racing around chasing down leads, friends had called me Girl Reporter, a motivational tool, a rallying cry designed to propel me out the door to battle the interminable city council meetings that waited for me in the Seattle suburbs. It was the mid-1990s and I had never heard of Nellie Bly, but I knew what a girl reporter was. Everyone did. She was a character plucked from movies and comic books and implied fearlessness, a glamorous exterior with a do-gooder heart, all that I wanted to be. But it was, hard to, it was a hard image to live up to in an industry which often didn't have space or even a framework to tell the stories I found the most important. Among the cute Mother's Day features was there room for a reckoning with substandard daycare. In the personal essay column and the op-ed page, could my colleague write about abortion? The answer at the time seemed to be no. The girl reporter of the 1888 Chicago Times expose though, offered a different picture, more complex, no less compelling. Here was someone writing about the reality of women's lives on the front page. When I encountered excerpts of her articles in Leslie Reagan's When Abortion Was a Crime, I found, rather than a roughly drawn cartoon, a flesh and blood young woman trying to figure things out about sex and writing and her place in the world. One wasn't supposed to discuss abortion and the Comstock Act banned it. And if one did, it should be a tragic tale of regret, not reports of well-off women mapping out their lives. Yet somehow the girl reporter managed to tell this radical tale. Like the readers of the world, the examiner or the tribune who raced out, raced to pick out the next issue featuring stunt reporters' escapades, after reading the girl reporter's investigations and growing to admire her wit and nerve, I wanted to find out what happened next. But I couldn't because after writing the Times piece, the girl reporter vanished. No one ever emerged from behind the pseudonym to take the credit. But her identity seemed key to the nature of her story. Was it a cautionary tale about a country girl who comes to the metropolis and is taken advantage of by a money hungry editor? Or a rags to riches fable about a reporter trying to make a reputation as one of the doctors accused her of doing on the path to a blazing career? A call to action about the birth of an activist? Or a romance where the heroine finds the right man and disappears into domesticity? The girl reporter posed some question about writing about myself that I needed to answer. The girl reporter's frank wrestling with the desire to write about issues particular to women and her concern about condemnation stayed with me. So much so that years later, with a few hours to kill in downtown Chicago, I found myself drawn to a cavernous room in the Harold Washington Memorial Library, dominated by banks of microfilm machines, half of them broken. The reels for the Chicago Times, a dreadful paper no one cared about, nestled in a cardboard box. If I read the whole series from the promotional banner to the final outraged letter to the editor, I told myself, thread threading the film through, the method through with methodical optimism, I bet I can find her. So that sort of takes me into um, the search for, for the girl reporter. I love that part. And um, I think I've told you this before, but um, around the time you were dropping out of being a reporter, I was dropping out of being um, a student in journalism school when I was doing my undergrad. I didn't feel like there was a space for, for me and the kind of stories I would tell and um, and my my disposition, which at the time I thought just wasn't journalistic, but now I understand how gendered that was. And I think if this book had been on our syllabus or had been in a bookstore and I picked it up, I might've thought differently about what was possible for me. Um, but I'm also really glad to be an essayist and I'm glad you became an essayist too. In part, I think what's so interesting about the essay form that maybe wouldn't be possible in journalism is like, I think um, a reasonable person might say, well, you need to know someone's name at a minimum to write a really compelling biography of them. But to me, this girl reporter is is very much um, an alive character in these pages. And um, I think people have just heard that in the passage you were reading. And so I was wondering if you could talk about how you made the fact that her story was sort of incomplete or mysterious sort of work for you or operate as part of this larger project? Yeah, um, thank you for asking that. Well, one of the things that drew me to her originally was um, just her voice on the page. Like she's not, um, 
she's not very objective reporter at all. And she really is very free, like talking about her thoughts and feelings. Um, you know, she talks about how she sometimes feels like she can't get out of this disguise. And she talks about how, um, she sort of puzzles over the fact like, did she imagine that she would get her start in journalism with an assignment like this? Cause she had thought that she would have to be very much like a man in order to succeed in journalism. But actually this was an assignment that no man could have done. Um, so all these sort of really interesting asides. So I tried to pull as much of her voice as I possibly could. Um, and then I always really, well, one, I enjoy like, a research quest and where it's it's foregrounded in the book. And I suspect that maybe you do too. Um, and so I managed to learn a lot about her and the time just in the effort of the search, right? Like one of my ideas was like, okay, well I will, how many female reporters could there have been in Chicago in 1888? Like probably three and I'll, you know, find out who they are and see if she was one of them. There were so many, <laughs> there were so many. So that in itself is sort of like a window into the world um, that I didn't know about. And then it was also just very interesting um, that other people, particularly women writers had also found the series very memorable. Like I thought she just kind of dropped off the face of the earth at the end of the series, but there's at least two other women writers who even a decade later are talking about that stunt that that girl did for the Chicago Times. And they're both appalled. Like they're both like, can't believe either that she did it or that an editor asked her to do it. Um, but that also was really interesting to me that the story, and was par part of an answer, right? That the story had that kind of staying power. Um, but now can I ask you a question about your book? Um, which sure. I just have to say, I just wanna highlight to people how much I love this book. It's really amazing. Thanks. Um, and so I, like one of the things that I love about it is um, the way that it doesn't only tell stories of people accused of witchcraft, um, but it also intercuts that with moments from the narrator's life, creating this parallel story, which, um, I mean, the narrator just doesn't come up here and there. Like there's really an arc um, that the narrator goes through over the course of the book. And I wondered if you could read a section that involved that weaving and then talk about why it was important to you to relate history in this particular way. Sure, I was trying to um, pick excerpts and I'll confess, I always wanna, when I'm trying to excerpt things and cut, I always wanna cut all of the personal stuff and just read you all about the witches because um, to me that's, um, that was what was really fascinating to me and what made me want to write. But I sort of like had this, um, the the dilemma I had was that, um, I don't know, I couldn't always convey because there was incomplete information about their lives. There was always some like little spark of something in their, in their context or in some line they had inside of their, um, inside their forced torture, forced confessions that were then spun into propaganda. Something like some moment of truth or personality that came through a little like glimmer of defiance that I um, made me want to write about them. But there was so little that um, I realized that it was really like, there was, there was this way that I was interpreting it or there was something I was bringing to it that I had to surface for the readers in order that, for them to hear the thing um, that I was hearing and delight in the way I was delighting. So. Um, so that's sort of why the personal ends up being in there so much. If I if I could have figured out how to just just give you witches and leave myself out of it, I really would have. Um, uh, when we were planning for today, you mentioned that um, the essay wrote about Marie Gonzalez Cajada might be um, worth reading. So I'll read you all just some excerpts from that to sort of I guess illustrate this. So. Um, Maria Gonçalves Cajada, the accused sorceress from colonial Brazil, once said, if the bishop has a mitre, I have a mitre. And if the bishop preaches from the pulpit, I preach from the cadera. And now I shall skip over things about shipwrecks and witches of the sea and jump to love spells. The main business of a Brazilian witch was love spells, which formed an important industry in colonial Brazil's underground economy. No records of Maria Gonçalves Cajada's methods are extant but we have Portuguese accounts of other witches reported to be very good and reliable with their work. One used the native herb Supora Miriam and the native bird Bemtevi, which is of the tyrant flycatcher family, whose males are known for being constant and protective parents. Their call translates as, I see you well. 
to attract faithfully married men to her desperate clients, a witch would recite, Bimtevi, Bimtevi, as thou art a Bimtevi, and thou knowest not how to take leave. O oh, Bimtevi, even if far he be, soon he shall return to me. And though this is not the version of love I long for, there have been times when I had to remind myself how much I don't want it and how much I hate it when people try to make difficult things seem simple. Um, skipping over some really wonderful examples of spells because um, I want to get back to talking to you, Kim. But uh, when Maria wandered the countryside begging with her dear but inexperienced friend Dominguez Fernandez, Maria told everybody Dominguez was a saint and that touching or being touched by the nervous woman was a virtue. And she added, clever and practical, that it would cost you a certain number of crusados to give such magic a try. Maria Gonsalves Cajada suffers a bad ending and I don't like it. I don't like that the moral becomes one about the treachery of women. I don't like that the only way to learn anything about Maria Gonsalves Cajada is to first learn that everyone called her by her nickname, Arde Leo Rabo, which translates as butt that burns that every index and parathetical aside acknowledges the name by which the inquisitors, the torturers, and the cruelest of customers knew her, the one that came to her most likely as a side effect of sex work. I don't like that it was the name she was given because she was a woman who would tell nothing but the truth. I don't like that this is the way every story of radical friendship seems to end, but it only seems that way because of who has been allowed to write the stories. My dear friend read the first drafts and the last ones. She read the letters I sent and the ones I didn't. She read the ones I received too. I have confessed a lot here, but she is the one who showed me the whales and she has secrets of mine which she will take to her grave. So let's think instead for a moment about Dominguez who vanishes from the archives immediately after her journey with Maria is over. As far as we know, anything could have happened to her. Though we cannot know what it was, we can surmise she was given something by her friend upon their parting. It might have been a rung of ladder or a plank of boat, a powder gathered from the back of some toad in the forest or an egg soaked in the magic of her pudenda. Maybe it made her invisible or invincible or rich enough to call herself free. Maybe it made it so she could find a way to go back home or to some new home further along that mud splattered road. Maybe it made it so she be could become the person she always thought she had the right to be. If any part of what people said about her were true, I want it to be that Maria Gonzalez Cajada had this power to share and she did, that it touches the shores of our lives even now. So I guess, um, yeah, so I talked a bit at the beginning about like, I'm, I'm just looking um, when I'm reading or researching, there's there, like, I, I get hit by like some little spark or glimmer of some something that feels like truth in the archives. And um, I find that though that I need like um, the personal to try to bring the reader along with me. Um, I did struggle a lot with um, how to use the personal in this book in a way that maybe was um, not such a question in some of my earlier projects, um, because um, obviously there's nothing in my life that would like compare in a meaningful way to being tortured and put on trial. Like there's no there's no metaphor there. And similarly, um, uh, I mean, in the in the case of Maria Gonzalez Cajada, that the practice of witchcraft in, for for women in colonial Brazil was also like often tied to a practice of resistance against. Um, the slave holding colonizing forces. Um, so a lot, in addition to the love spells, there were a lot of like protection spells designed to protect people from um, the, from their masters. So, um, so those, those, um, those metaphors, I was trying to navigate them and think about like, how could I, how could I help readers sort of see what I was seeing without like creating kind of a, a, a tacky empty metaphor. Um, and what I ended up thinking about was like, what I really wanted to do with these portraits of um, witches, uh, accused witches, um, was sort of respond to them in a way that people respond to like, I was thinking about lives of the saints because I was raised Catholic. And so I was thinking about how like, what you do when you encounter a saint who's like a giant of resilience and resistance and power and divinity, which I think is a very nice way to maybe describe some of these sort of like legends of the witch trials. Um, what you do is you bring to them your like, as like an offering or as prayers for, for their kind of intercession, you just bring them your like, cruddy little boring life with your like marital spats or whatever and you kind of like lay it at their feet and so I guess I was sort of thinking to the degree that um I brought my personal stuff to bear in the essays I wanted it to be kind of that relationship um so yeah um speaking of giants Kim can we talk about Nellie Bly oh we can always talk about Nellie Bly um yes um will you read us um something about her first I will. Um, let me just find that that section. Um, 
Yeah, so the the opening chapters of the book talk about Nellie Bly because she was really like the match that ignited the spark of these like 10 years of innovative reporting. Um, so the section that I'm gonna read, Nellie Bly is just this young woman without a job sitting in Allegheny City, which is across the street from Pittsburgh. And the Pittsburgh Dispatch has this columnist who generally writes about like, you know, proper use of umbrellas, but has been going off for the past couple of weeks about the women's sphere and how annoyed he is when he steps up, when women step out of the women's sphere. And um, this is prompted by this man who writes in called Anxious Father. And he's like, I have all these daughters and they're not getting married and what should I do? And that's like the opening for this columnist to go off about the women's sphere. And um, Nellie Bly, writes a letter to the paper in response. So this is a little bit what was going on with her. For the young writer in Allegheny City, this idea of domestic bliss directly contradicted her personal experience. She'd heard her mother called whore and bitch by her alcoholic stepfather and watched as he choked her. Marriage made her mother wish she was dead. At 14, the girl, her younger sister, her mother and her brother fled the house as the stepfather leapt up from a dinner table argument brandishing a gun. Over the course of several days, he barricaded himself inside and destroyed their home, smashing furniture and flower pots, upending the table, kicking holes in wall plaster. Hard to play an angel in this domestic paradise. She wanted something more, but what? Teaching was an option for smart young women, and so she started at Indiana State Normal School with high hopes. Her father left some money when he died, but the executor, misman executor mismanaged it, and funds ran out after one term. She found herself back home. Factory worker, servant, shop clerk, fields open to women had applicants lined up to apply. In the dispatches help wanted section, things looked equally bleak. The city was recovering from a nationwide recession marked by a stock market crash, meager prices on corn and wheat, and a bank panic that shuttered the Penn Bank in Pittsburgh and left the streets crowded with the unemployed. So listings were thin. But still that January, in the mail help columns readers could find, wanted, manager for art publications for the best house in the trade, wanted, experienced press boy that can make himself generally useful in a printing office, Wanted, a good barber. Wanted, agents in every county in Western Pennsylvania, West Virginia and Eastern Ohio to sell the celebrated electric light lamp. But reading further down to the female help listings, job seekers would find only wanted, two good dishwashers at Horner's Chop House. Wanted, a good girl for general housework. Wanted, a chambermaid from 25 to 40 years of age, one that can make good soup. The letter writer saw herself an anxious father's daughters. How frustrating to be brushed off as useless when she had so much to offer. It wasn't fair. The young woman, called Pinky by friends and relatives, wrote the newspaper to say so. Her writing style was unpolished, to say the least. Punctuation as haphazard as hail. But she made a passionate argument rooted in a real situation, her life. She wrote about applying for jobs, being treated badly, and rejected over and over. She was too small. They didn't have any openings. The pay for women was less than half what a man might make, nothing one could live on. She signed it Lonely Orphan Girl and sent it off. Flipping through the dispatch several days later, she didn't find her letter, but this instead. If the writer of the communication signed Lonely Orphan Girl will send her name and address to this office merely as a guarantee of good faith, she will confer a favor and receive the information she desires. So the next day she shows up at the office um, and she's off. That's the, the start of, of Nellie Bly's writing career. Um, and from there she goes into Blackwell's Insane Asylum for Women and around the world um, and to the Pullman strike and all of the really important reporting that she did. Um, and because I was writing about um, people that were much more obscure and didn't have a lot of information about them at some points, um, I thought it was important to have like a couple 
more well-known stories to use as a thorough line or a backbone. So I kind of use Nellie Bly as one of the backbones of the book and check in with her periodically. Um, and the same with like the newspaper battle between um, Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst, which I think a lot of people have some sense of, you know, sort of all the scandals of yellow journalism in the 1890s. Um, so that was another backbone of kind of known people and known story that we that I touched on um, and kind of used as reference points for these people that that readers might not have heard of. So. Um, that was a technique I noticed that I really admired and loved and was sort of curious to know more about how you like put it all together, right? Is, um, it's like, so Nellie Bly's story sort of operating as this backbone, as you say. Um, but I thought it was, and I, I was, one of the things I was struck by over and over again is how like, you know, Nellie Bly has got this kind of iconic story. I wondered how, you know, like, like how will you make that feel fresh or new? And one of the things I felt like you were doing is reminding us that she wasn't like this solitary genius. She was like, part of this like um like movement it had a, it's kind of a, a collective of all of these women um doing this work um um but i guess um i wondered how you were able like in, in terms of like your research methods or as you were writing the book like how did you hold that many stories um at, together as you're like like right now you make it seem easy like oh there's just the nelly bly backbone and then kim statching in and out but like i was curious like what in the messy days of starting the book, how did you come to that process or what did it look like on, along the yeah, way? Yeah, yeah, um, that's a really good question. I just wanna like back up by like just a tiny bit to think about Nellie Bly, and, cause I can ask this of you too, which is like when there's a story that's really well known, like the story of Nellie Bly or the story of like the Salem witch trials, which you talk about a little bit, like how, like what efforts do you go to to make that fresh? Um, mm -hmm. And I think with, and you talked a little bit about how you used your personal life as sort of like a way into people. Like, you know, people might have had this relationship with a friend or people might have wished for some kind of love spell. Um, and that's something that resonates with readers into a story that might otherwise feel like either distant in time or stale mm -hmm. because they know it. Um, so in that, in that section, kind of as I was introducing Bly, the what, one thing that was so valuable was that her testimony in her mother's divorce is available. Like the county in Pennsylvania was just like, oh, sure, I will send you that for $18. <laughs> and I was like, that was like my best moment of writing the whole book. <laughs> so you see, you know, like I think that people understand what it would feel like to have your mother called a whore, like in front of you. Um, or to have, you know, a violent man destroying your house. And that's all very visceral there. And I think people also understand maybe more people of our age than of a younger age, but what it feels like to go through the help wanted ads and like really be needing a job and there just being like absolutely nothing there. Um, so that was kind of another angle in, um, so I don't know, I mean, can I, can I flip that to you? Like, how do you make a story like the Salem Witch Trials, which again, you know, people read about in history books or maybe they were in the Crucible in high school. Um, how do you make that not feel like something that people have read before? Um, yeah, I think the, the, a lot of times I didn't write, I didn't, I didn't like, there are a lot of Salem which is I don't touch on in part because their stories felt thoroughly told. Like I didn't see a way to say anything new, so I just skipped them. And I think I would say like one of the like triggers for me that I wanted to write about someone would be um, if uh, if I felt like I could suddenly see this, I could see the story as propaganda. Like if the pro like like if the propaganda was transparent enough that it immediately registered as propaganda, I knew I wanted to write that one. So um, so Tichaba story um like i wouldn't have thought initially that i would want to write about any of the salem witches and the reason i ended up wanting to write about tichuba for example was i i came across something that that mentioned that she was um that she was not uh african-american afro-caribbean which is the way she gets depicted in the crucible and in most of the other media since then um since then and also before that it goes back to longfellow's a, a play longfellow did about the salem witch trials where he depicts her that way um so she was indigenous and um the um, the historian I read who who wrote a pretty thorough biography of her um, 
uh, I'm blanking on that historian's name right now. She um, she makes, I think, a really strong case for the idea that um, that Tijba was probably Arawak um, based on the records of like where, so Samuel Parrish, and Samuel Parrish brought her with her to Salem as, uh, as his slave. So, um, so right away I was like, oh, why, why that change? Why was that important? Um, why was that important in the 19th century to, to sort of people's notions of, um, to, yeah, like wh what was that, like what, like, what was that doing for them, uh, for white people in particular? And, um, and like, and like still, yeah, why, what does that do for like this society to keep, to keep telling the story that way? So I was just really interested in kind of unpacking like what, um, uh, but what I would say, like what anxieties about like having, you know, having a nation built on genocide, um, get eased by like moving moving her enslavement into um into uh, a narrative where she's black instead of indigenous um so that was one of the reasons i wanted to write about her and then it became an essay that was sort of thinking a lot about um like the th like dispossession of land from indigenous people more generally and also thinking about the role of slavery and building the colony so, so it became like a, yeah so basically I just wanted to peel back the layers of that propaganda and understand it better. And there's a lot of other wishes in the book that were similarly propagandized. Um, uh, Angela de la Bart, we don't even know she existed because she's, her story exists um, in, in print 300 years after the fact solely as like a cautionary tale. So it's really interesting to read that story and sort of see the ways in which she's being like vilified and treated as a monster um, for the purposes of sort of um, freaking out anyone who would dare any woman who would dare to like own property and um and a leadership position in like city government or whatever um yeah so so my answer that's propaganda um but you kind of flipped it back on me really quickly I before <laughs> <laughs> okay um so i want to um but um yes yeah, so i wanted to ask, ask about your the backbone um yeah. i also just wanted to ask about like yeah, I guess maybe you've alluded to this a little bit with Nellie Blind. I was also wondering about writing, writing about people who are so well known for you as well, right? Like, um, um, were there other techniques or tactics or like new, new sort of previously unknown pieces of information about her that um, that you came across, or were there ways that you were um, juxtaposing her with um, lesser known reporters that were sort of making her story resonate in new ways? Yeah, I mean, I think that like that's kind of interesting about having that large cast of characters. I do find having a large cast of characters, and maybe that's why I ducked the question. It was really hard. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, it was it was hard, and um, you wanted them for the sake of the narrative of the book for them to meet up. And there are like three different points where they met up, but I kind of didn't know that going into it um, that there would that they would have the opportunity to sometimes be in scene together. Um, and I mean, so one of the things that you get though with that large cast of characters and not talking about like the exceptional individual, which I think um, people like to do with history in general and then like women's history in particular is, um, you know, like, oh, there was two, there was two famous female journalists or two, female journalists doing interesting things in the 19th century. And that was Nellie Bly and Ida B. Wells. Um, and it's like, no, there was lots and lots of women journalists doing interesting things. But when you put them all together and you cover them over the course of 10 years, you do get these sort of like sense of the demographics, which I think is really mm -hmm. interesting, right? Like, oh, like it wasn't just Nellie Bly who was a young woman who needed a job at this time period and was facing these particular hurdles. All the stunt reporters that I wrote about were um, born roughly the same time period, like during or immediately after the Civil War. And they either were orphans. Um, Nellie Bly was not technically an orphan, though she called herself Lonely Orphan Girl. She was just, I think, very mad at her mother at that point. Um, but or and they didn't or they didn't have they were either orphans or they did not have like a, a strong father figure who was like helping to launch them in the world in whatever way they needed to be launched. Um, you know, Ida B. Wells like also also an orphan, um, taking care of many younger siblings. Um, so that's interesting to note. It's interesting to note that a number of them like all get married the same year, like right after this financial crash, like when they're in their early thirties. Um, 
interesting that during this period of the 1890s when um, the women's suffrage movement was sort of at a low ebb and not getting a lot of traction, that a lot of them felt kind of conflicted about suffrage. You know, it didn't it didn't seem like a, a going concern. There wasn't a lot of energy or excitement behind it. Um, so I think that was the use of um, of looking at all of these people, very different people, um, but going through similar things, similar life events at a similar time period. Um, so. When I think about like why your book feels particularly inspiring to to me now, but also to the me that um, that bailed on journalism. Um, I think you know, like I think the 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 lone genius kind of narrative you sometimes um, will see, or like what you were saying about like oh there was just Nellie Bly and Ida B. Wells. Um, that feel feels um, that seems almost impossible, right? Like who would be so special as to be the one person in their generation? who could break from the norms. Um, but what your book shows is like, oh no, they had models, they had inspirations. Um, you know, like like even though there aren't that many moments where you get to actually like document them being in the same room together and being friends, just that sense of like, they were part of like kind of creating uh, a culture together. T to me, that's like oh, very manageable. I have smart friends. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it, like, so then it, it feels like it, it's possible to like kind of see um, like the ability to kind of like do, do this kind of big leap or this big this big bold break with expectations um, if that's the history that you're you're kind of building on yeah yeah that that is that is a great point it's a much easier entry point if you are allowed yourself to like see inspiration around you or see yourself as part of a group of people making a certain kind of progress. Um, but now let's get back to my question for you which did have to do with I mean you talked about, kind of, you know, seeing through the established history. Um, and I like, you know, you're, you're talking about it as propaganda or, you know, something seems false or you can see like why it would be told a certain way to obscure a certain truth. Um, but I wondered if you'd read another section that, that might illustrate that a little bit. Sure. Um, I think I'll read to you about Angela de la Barthe for just a little bit. Um, because, yeah, because that, that propaganda was so, um, so intense. Um, all right, so Thomas Aquinas wondered if our atmosphere was a punishment for demons, and he concluded no, but also wondered if demons could experience sorrow. He concluded no, but wondered if the will of the demon was obstinate in evil. He concluded not really, but wondered if they, being coagulated creatures of air, could produce spawn by copulating with witches. He concluded, no, but what if they disguise themselves as women to steal the seed of men? This must be how Angela de la Barthe, a well-known woman of property and means in Aquinas' Toulouse, came to be a mother at age 52, or was it 64? Accounts vary. Wolf-headed, serpent-tailed, her child, it was said, fed on the fresh corpses of infants for two years before he ran away in the night. Or so she said after the inquisitor, Hugo de Benioles tortured her and threatened to burn her alive if she did not confess. Or perhaps she said, in 1275, Congress with demons was not yet listed as a crime and there are no transcripts of her trial, though there is no shortage of them from other trials in that same year. So serious historians consider the 15th century chronicle of her so-called life to be specious and, and apocryphal, imperfect to the point of meaninglessness though I go on for many pages about why I don't think it's meaningless. And then um, I'll just end with this part that might also be relevant. If I were Angela de la Barthe, I would have confessed to whatever bullshit they wanted to hear too. And when they burned me after all for what I said instead of what I didn't say, I guess like most of the people in this situation on a pyre, I wouldn't bother with pleas or curses either. Like some chronicler out of the 15th century, I have been asking dead people to help me understand what my life is for. I imagine how this woman would have watched the sun rising beyond the crowd, noticing how nice it feels when a beam of morning light warms the skin on your shoulder, like the hand of a person you desire or a very fine silk fabric that proves itself worth its cost when you feel the thrill of how it slips down your arm, almost, but not quite, as if it were never meant to be there in the first place. Um, Kim, I, I'm watching this little timer click in the corner of our screen and I know Eric <sighs> back soon, but I wanted to ask you before you go though, you have a like a preamble to your book where you talk about the sort of 
the typical stories people tell about the history of um, creative nonfiction and how it gets situated as this kind of like gonzo journalism or um, immersion journalism story beginning with like men in the middle of the 20th century and that Nellie Bly gets left out of that story and all of these girl stunt reporters get left out of that story. So I was wondering if you could sort of just tell us like a little bit about how you tell yourself and tell your students the story of our genre now that you've done all this research. Oh, that's a good question. I, I mean, I'll be interested to see like how I present it in class, like the next time I have the opportunity. But I think the realization grew out of teaching like surveys of creative nonfiction and, you know, teaching all these great writers. Um, but then for like each of the men, it would be like, um, it would be, you know, uh, Truman Capote, he founded the genre of the nonfiction novel. Tom Wolfe, he founded new journalism. Um, Hunter S. Thompson, he founded gonzo journalism. So like each man like made the claim to a genre. And then there was all of these wonderful women that we talked about, uh, Maxine Hong Kingston and Maya Angelou and Joan Didion, but they were not like, I'm the founder of this genre. And so um, it was just interesting to then go back and kind of like expand the search for the roots of creative nonfiction and being like, oh, like these women were doing all these same things and conducting all these experiments, um, but it had just been like devalued and kind of thrown on the, the trash heap of history. So um, even though like, Maybe I don't totally approve of like planting genre flags. Like I wanted to plant a little bit of one on their behalf <laughs> just to even the scales. So um, yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to, to see what we say. But, but thinking about that and kind of the history of literary and creative nonfiction, I thought it was interesting rereading your book, which I hadn't realized that we both really talk about uh, mules and Men by Zora Neale Hurston as being mm -hmm. like really important to this, um, and I do always come back to um, her sort of book of anthropology, where like she just like she kind of puts on this cloak of anthropology and um, like being the impartial observer, and then just like completely does not completely like does anthropological research on her hometown goes to parties, like gets all this information that only she can access because who she she's who she is. Um, and it's just really wonderful collapsing of all of that. I don't know if you wanna say something about her. Yeah, whenever I talk about research methods, I'm always talking, I'm like, like let's talk about Zora Neale Hurston's research methods. Yeah. They're great, actually, like, like there's, and they're woven into the book itself, right? So they're like part of the story, which I think is a, very like I guess a very postmodern way of doing fiction, right? It's like you're upfront about your positionality in the in the gathering of the information. But like so like she has like these asides where she says things like, um, oh, she couldn't hang out with her like she was very careful not to hang out with um the same men multiple nights in a row, even if they were very good storytellers, because she didn't want anybody in the community to get the idea that she had a boyfriend because then they'd stop telling her stories. Like she had to remain it's this illusion of being an available single woman to get certain kinds of tales or like there's this also this site where oh her one of her her um her source that kind of gets her into these this logging camp um that woman gets in like a big drunken brawl and she like has this moment where she's like should i get in my car and drive away from this brawl or like you know she's like if i just if i don't participate in the brawl i betrayed my source and i'm kind of done with this camp anyway but do i want to get in this brawl or do i want to flee from the brawl and she just decides she's like no it's all too good. The stories are too good. So she just like throws in and like jumps in and like tussles with her friend, um, which I just think is like so great, right? Friendship over, I don't know. I guess I just really like that mixture of like, like her, her values are like friendship and get the good story. And that the good story is always just like, for her, it's not like the scoop or the news. It's just like these folk tales. I think that's like way great. Yeah, so. for sure. Definitely founded several genres right there. Yeah, um, Eric, do you want to come back? Are there any questions for us? I I, I would love to come back. Although I would also love to just uh, keep listening to you uh, talk because it's wonderful. Um, it's so much fun to hear so many of the overlapping things between your two books, and that was certainly the 
thing that I had noticed just reading them kind of uh, in near proximity because they're both so recent uh, and sort of thinking, wow, it's just kind of amazing how these books that seem very different on the surface uh, really speak to each other in, in dynamic ways. And your conversation tonight is certainly bringing that out. So yeah, I would love to lay a couple of questions on you. Um, and this, this, uh, this first one maybe comes, you, you've been alluding to it throughout, uh, and certainly uh, at the top of the presentation, uh, uh, Kate put it very forcefully, in fact, um, by revealing that uh, not only did you leave journalism because you were called, uh, felt a calling as a poet and an essayist and a different kind of writer, but that there were gendered forces at work as well. And that, um, uh, I think a lot about what's happening with journalism now and what we need to do to uh, reclaim its importance uh, in, in the world. And uh, so that's a real issue. That's not an issue that is unique to you or unique to the past. Um, and it also, it dovetails interestingly with so much of what's happening in Sensational. I mean, one of the things you draw out, Kim, and that I think a lot of us know, but it's, we don't know it in, in a palpable way is that uh, I think at one point you point out that more, uh, you know, at the turn of the century, there were more uh, women writers than male writers in journalism being published in newspapers. Um, so these sorts of questions about how the field is gendered and how that plays out in the in the structure of what happens is just really fascinating. And so I wondered if each of you can sort of reflect maybe on um, how that is has shaped or is shaping uh, the storytelling that we need from journalism. Wow, that's that's a big one. Um, I did just want to to nitpick a little bit. So at the turn of the century, more women had bylines than men had bylines. So it was sort of a convention for a long time that that articles were unsigned. Um, but then the stunt reporters really created this sort of. I don't know, like cult of personality around themselves. So it mattered to people who was writing which article. So a lot of women had bylines, which is no less cool. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting about the, the these stunt journalists was that um, they were not just women journalists, but they were specifically writing about issues relevant to women. Um, because they were female, they could go into like a female dominated factory and write about conditions there. Nellie Bly, you know, specifically went into the Black Girls Insane Asylum for Women, which she had access to because she was a woman. The girl reporter could write about abortion in a way that she very overtly says like men couldn't. Um, and I, but I remember when I was starting out about a, as a reporter, I consciously thought to myself like, well, I know how to be taken seriously. I just have to not write about things related to women. Um, and that was like my, my thing that I had discovered, right? And I was just like keeping it close to my chest. I was like, this is the key to success. Um, so I think that's something that, that papers still wrestle with now even. Um, there's certainly like amaz many amazing women reporters and there's certainly like good reporting about women's issues, but I still feel like a lot of times it's not taken as seriously. I still feel like though the women's pages aren't like overtly labeled women's pages, um, I think there's a lot of coded women's pages. There's a lot of like subsections of newsletters or uh, of newspapers that are like of special interest to women, you can get the, you know, this newsletter or, you know, the style section. Um, it's sort of, you know, the things that are frivolous and that you don't really need to care about. So I would just like to see more women's issues on the front page, which is where they belong. So. Yeah, Kate, did you wanna, um... Uh, chime in on this or yeah oh, I'm not sure I can do better than Kim I, I would say I was so young when I bailed on journalism and I just sort of stopped I mean like I listen to the news every day but I'm not sure I follow I have followed it as closely as a genre I, I also my my sort of like last assignment in journalism was uh we were supposed to interview someone in the profession and um and I reached out to to three um 
men who um, were sort of like peripheral, you know, like acquaintances with my my parents and um, to try to get interviews and uh, none of them would return my calls. Like none of them would do the interview. And, uh, and I sort of understand that now as like, why wouldn't you, anyway, why wouldn't you return someone's call? And I'm skeptical that if um, I had been a, been a, one of the men in the class that I wouldn't have gotten the call. And it was sort of like on top of this sort of like um, a lot of guest speakers and a lot of talk in the class about like, like this macho war correspondent energy where I was like, oh, like, um, like um, they were, you know, and, and anyway, they were afraid of being shot. And that seems like a legitimate fear if you're a war correspondent. But like, I would say, I was like, I was like, oh, am I prepared to, to, I, I, it just seems like there's a different kind of violence that women must contend with when they're trying to imagine themselves in this position. So it just felt like the whole story of journalism in that class was just loaded with this like um, kind of energy and violence. So, um, but, um, and it made me very, like, I just became very reluctant to do interviews in general. So Kim and I were having a conversation not so long ago where I was like, I was like, what do you tell students when they're nervous about reporting? Because I'm still like nervous about reporting. And I, Kim had this really funny joke that I like realized is like, like my whole mantra, which is um, that like, that she mostly just deals with dead people so that you don't have to do the, the interviews. And I was like, oh, I didn't even notice. That's what I've done though, is I'm like, oh, I'll just write about dead people and they won't give me any trouble. And I don't have to feel stressed out. By, uh, <laughs> I guess, I, I guess, it, so I, I mean, I guess it's sort of a coward's way out or whatever, but, um, but, um, but I've found it very rewarding to, uh, to go to the archives and like get the answers to the questions I want without, um, without having to put on a flak jacket or something. Right. And, and that's actually, uh, uh, you've almost answered it. It's sort of my next question was, um, that impulse toward the archival, because it's another thing that uh, that unites your books. And uh, even though it plays out in, in sort of different ways, different methods, maybe, um, I, I feel as a reader that um, there's that fascination, like, oh, something is there to be excavated. Um, mm -hmm. And and I can do that. Um, and, and then, you know, and the reader catches that excitement where we, we get to watch you dig it out. Uh, so where does that impulse uh, for the archival come from? Is it natural curiosity, or is it is it uh, is there a craft element? Um, well, I think about how Kim literally talked about the the trash heaps of history, but like um, but like trash heaps are really good. Um, like like going through the trash heaps is like really good research methodology. Um, so like. Um, yeah, like all like most of our frag like most of Sappho's lines we have because people were going through these trash heaps in in uh, at Oxyrhinus Oxyrhynchus in out in Egypt and um and they found them um like they weren't even just so what they were is like like an accountant had like written like like or, or like somebody like a business person had, like written like numbers from like like keeping track of their business ledgers on the back of these papers that had Sappho's poems and then when they were done with that because they didn't want to waste the papyrus stuffed it in a crocodile like a, like a mum like a mum like they used it as stuffing for a mummified bite crocodile so it was just like like trash that was recycled into like recycled into ledger paper and then recycled into like mummified crocodile stuffing and then the crocodile was just thrown away so like and then like like Sappho's on the back so like so much good stuff is in the trash. Um, and I am sort of like, I do love a good junk store. And I like, I love that feeling of like, um, seeing some kind of like thing that's been abandoned as worthless and, and considering that in fact, it tells someone's like whole story. I just, I find that to be a, um, I find that to be a nice way to be in the world, right? Just to like, like be looking at um, what might be beautiful about something that's been dis discarded. So. Yeah, I mean, that is, very well said, um, what might be beautiful about something that's been discarded. I mean, honestly, I just think I'm nosy. And I like to read the letters that Nellie Bly sent to her mother. <laughs> like, it's just interesting to me in like a really nosy kind of way that, you know, he saw all this violence with her mother when she was a teenager. And still like decades later, she's like, don't let my brother like take advantage of you in a real estate deal. Like you have to be selfish, like look out for yourself and be sure that you have enough warm enough coat. You know, those little human details are just totally fascinating to me. And I think, I think I do interview quite a few live people. Okay, that isn't all dead people, but I'm mostly <laughs> interviewing live people um, about their, their expertise. It's less about, 
um, the intimate details of their lives, then I feel like I have much more free reign. Um, you know, yeah, if somebody's material has been sitting for 150 years in the archives, so. That's awesome. I haven't talked to a live person in 20 years. <laughs> uh, well, uh, finally, um, uh, just one more, one more uh, common thread to tease out uh, is about power. And um, it was something that I felt came up in, in your books um, a lot, often as, as subtext, as much as, as on the surface. But uh, it was even there in your first, uh, the first excerpt, excerpt you shared tonight, Kate, uh, that one of the, you know, we have the, the 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 fear of the power of witches, and one of the powers they have is the power to share, and in in your in your phrase, um, and and that feels so true. Like yes, that's the power of the journalist. That's the power of the writer. Um, so how, uh, uh, and it's and it's ironic that there's a fear of that that power to share. Um, so I guess my question for both of you is how do aspiring um, witches, journalists, writers, uh, activists, uh, how can we hone uh, that power to share uh, at the moment? Yeah. In a witch trial, they really needed the witch to confess. Um, and the reason they knew that was because the confession would justify both that trial and and the next one like and it would also justify their whole religious schema because if there weren't if there weren't witches if witches weren't real then they just burned or hanged a whole lot of people that didn't need that so like once they got going they had to keep going and they just needed these confessions to keep coming so um most of the book is really sad right like because like almost nobody i write about gets out alive very few tituba gets out alive but most of the women don't and um but what they What's interesting to me as a marker of power is when they refuse to give the inquisitors the story they want um, and they disrupt the trial. Either they refuse altogether to confess or like they put a curse on the whole town and everybody's freaked out for 300 years afterwards, or they um, introduce into the narrative of the trial some like glimmer of like doubt in the minds of the inquisitors or doubt in the uh, like legitimacy of the process. Um, and I guess to me, I'm interested in that as like, like that's the, that's them being storytellers like and really good ones right or like or journalists or you know like that's that's the writer in them or that's where i see the writer in me mirrored in them it's like oh yeah like you can't beat the whole system it's too big but they they like fuck it up for a minute and that's like really nice when you get to see that in the archives <laughs> um yeah that's so interesting i mean i think my my answer is more straightforward. Like you're talking a little bit about the, the power of withholding or refusing to confess or refusing to say what people want you to say. Um, and, you know, I, I think that for women during this time period, it was just having the courage to talk about what actually matters, right? Like previous to that, like if women were hired to write for newspapers, they were hired to write things that were frivolous, right? Like write the report of the ball or write about, you know, opinions about the bustle um, and that kind of thing. And, and that was what they had a platform for. Um, but, you know, to write about abortion the way that the girl reporter did, um, you know, even, even though she was less ostensibly condemning it and her paper was ostensibly condemning it, it was illegal. I mean, the Comstock law was like, you cannot print information about abortion or birth control. Um, you know, it, it was against the law. So, um, and there's a lot of information about techniques of abortion in, in that particular space. So I think, I think it was like a bravery to talk about what mattered. Um, and I think that that carries through now, you know, uh, you just have to talk about be willing to talk about what matters. And that's really hard. <laughs> like I'm not making light of it. It's really hard. Right, yeah. Well, hopefully uh, and there are enough people to rise to the challenge because we, we desperately need them. Uh, thank you both uh, for your wonderful books and for your conversation tonight. Um, I also want to uh, let our viewers know that uh, if you're interested in this material, you might wanna join us next week as well. We'll have a special uh, daytime event with 
wonderful nonfiction writer from the United Kingdom, Olivia Lang. Uh, and um, uh, to everyone, uh, don't forget to hit that buy the book button if you're curious about either of those, either or both of the great books uh, that we've been talking about tonight. Uh, Kim and Kate, thank you again. Uh, be well on this rainy night. And to everyone out there, good night.